Hello and welcome to this PIR live event webinar brought to you in part by Partners in Research Canada. My name is Ben Hobbs and I will be your host today. I would like to introduce our guest today, Dr. Peter Hollings, Professor and Chair in the Department of Geology and Director of the Centre of Excellence and Sustainable Mining and Exploration. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Hollings. I'll let you take it from here. My pleasure. It's great to be here. So um, what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today is some of the work I do, which is trying to understand how volcanoes work. And I'm going to start by just giving you a, a sort of a brief rundown of how volcanoes work, show you some photographs of some of the cool places I've got to work as a geologist, and then we can answer some of your questions. So this first photo here is a volcano called White Island which is one in New Zealand. It's an active volcano. You can get out there by boat or by helicopter, and you can actually walk right into the crater and see the volcano erupting. So it's a, for us who study these sort of things, it's a pretty cool experience. So for volcanoes in general, I, I guess many of you know about places like the Ring of Fire and the, the areas where we see volcanoes, where volcanoes form where the Earth's crust is being subducted down into the interior and then melt, melting that material and it erupts in volcanoes. So on this map here, you can see all those little pink triangles. And they're the areas where we see the most of the world's volcanoes. There's a few in other places like Hawaii, but that's where we get most of our volcanic activity. So when we talk about a volcano, what do we mean? Well, they're, they're things, they're places where magma, which is the hot molten rock in the Earth's interior, is erupted out onto the surface and it can erupt in two ways. It can be explosive, uh, the, you know, where things you get these big sort of violent eruptions which maybe sort of cover huge areas and ash and debris, or they can be what we call effusive and gentle where the lavas come out. And think about places like Hawaii where we see that, where volcanoes have been erupting for tens of years continuously with these lava flows running down the slopes of the mountains. If we're thinking about these gentle ones, these effusive ones, then they come up and they bubble up really gently. And there's a variety of reasons for that, but mainly it's because they have very low amounts of volcanic gases in them. And that, think about a pop bottle, right? So if you've got a bottle of pop and you just open it, nothing really happens. But if you take that bottle of pop and you shake it really violently, then that's, open that and all the foam and everything comes out, that it's an explosive volcano, whereas if you just pour it into a glass, that's an effusive one. So the typical products that we get from those gentle lava flows are things like pahoehoe, which is a type of lava flow they named after Hawaii. And it's that top photograph there. You get these really slow moving, gentle flows of lava coming down the hillside, and they make these sort of ropey textures. Or you get the other type, which is this aa lava in the bottom photograph, and they're the really sort of blocky, and they just sort of move slowly rumbling down the hillside. They can be really quite, uh, quite beautiful. So this is again an example from Hawaii. And you can see that bright red lava flow making its way down the flanks. I think this one was a Kilauea volcano, just moving slowly down the hillside. They're not really dangerous. You can see here we've got photographs of people getting very close to lava flows. It would be quite hot, and if you fell in them, you know, it you, you would, you would not be very good, but you can get quite close because they're quite slow moving, they're quite predictable. They'll destroy buildings, but they really don't typically hurt people. And you know, we've got a photograph here of a, a, a scientist from the US Geological Survey who's actually sampling that lava flow. He's taken his hammer, he's poked it into the flow, pulled a bit of that molten rock out, and he's gonna drop it into that coffee can in the bottom of the photograph and take it back and analyze it and try and figure out exactly what's happening. And it's things like that that get me excited about geology. We'll be able to get that close to lava flows and study the way the earth works in this sort of real detail. But these things have been around for a billion years or more. So these are examples of those same pahoehoe flows, but these are from near where I live in Thunder Bay on Lake Superior, where we know the rocks are over a billion years old and we're seeing exactly the same textures. So we can use what we see in geology today to tell us about how rocks formed in the past. And that's one of the really cool things about geology and what we can learn from it. I've had a chance to go and see volcanoes all over the world. A couple of years ago, I got to go to Iceland, 
which is an area where there's a lot of really active volcanoes. Um, a few years ago, there was one of those volcanoes which erupted and closed airspace across Europe and created all sorts of chaos. But from a geologist's point of view, we can see things like this channel running down this thing, which was left by an old lava flow. This is probably about a 30, 40 year old lava flow, which moved down from the slopes of this beautiful volcano. As another example here is one of my colleagues standing on the side of this lava flow. And again, you can imagine just a few years ago, that would have been filled with hot molten rock moving its way down those slopes. We get spectacular features associated with these lava flows. This is an example from Victoria in Australia. And you can see that circular feature in the photograph with those radiating columns of material in it. Those are sort of where the lava tube, so this underground tube with the lava moving down through it, crystallized and cooled, and then these beautiful radial columns formed in there. Other examples of that, again, this is from Victoria in Australia, what we call columnar basalt. Some of the most famous ones are in Ireland, at, uh, in County Antrim in Ireland, called the Devil's Causeway. But they're all formed the same way. These blocks of magma solidify and cool, and you get these spectacular features in them. One of the really spectacular things we see in, in when volcanoes erupt is this feature called spatter cones. So these are photographs of a Hawaiian lava flow, which is just coming out of the ground and just sort of bubbling away and sending up these little blobs and, and gobs of lava up into the surface. And when they cool, they make these cones. So again, this is an example from Iceland. It's a beautiful spatter cone. And it's just where all that materials come up out of the surface and settle down to give you these beautiful craters. And if we look at the textures, you can see these, these drapes of lava. So this is hot molten lava, which has come down and then just oozed and fall, fallen over the sides of these volcanoes. And again, because of places like Iceland and Hawaii, we can study these processes today and use it to help us understand those processes in the past and try and figure out what's going on. Iceland, there was a volcanic eruption just two years ago, um, and that volcanic eruption created that flow on that right, that really dark colored flow on that right. The flow on the left, the gray colored flow, is 10,000 years old. So these, these are processes that are occurring over intervals of time and gaps of time, and they get overlaid in the geological record. So as geologists, we try and figure out relationships, which rocks cut which rocks, telling us about which is the younger one. But because we can go to places where it's happening today, we can see these processes in action. We get spectacular things like lava tubes. So this is again an example from Hawaii of one of those beautiful lava tubes coming down through, the, uh, through these volcanic flows. And you can see there's been multiple flows in here with sort of the, the sides would have been one flow and then a new flows come down through the middle and cut that feature and made again these beautiful spectacular things. Sometimes we get these big craters. So I got to go to the Southwest US a few years ago, um, a place called SP Crater. And you can see we're standing on the sides of the crater, this black lava we're standing on. And looking down, you can see in the distance where a flow has come out of the bottom of the crater and flowed across the hillsides or across the, the plains of the, the area there. This is uh, Mount Etna. I was in Italy a couple of years ago, and we can see a similar sort of thing. You can see at the top of the photograph there, my, my, if I move my mouse, you might see it up around here. There's a small crater up through there, and then coming out from it, there's this RR flow, this lava flow that's run down from the flanks. So this would have been a sort of spatter cone, the lava built up, and then just flows down the hillside. So by going to study volcanoes, we get to see these really spectacular features. And again, like I say, that helps us try and understand how these things worked in ancient rocks when we're trying to understand those processes. The other type of eruption are those explosive eruptions. So now we've, we've had the gently pouring the coke out of the bottle. Here we've shaken that pot bottle up and it's erupted really explosively. And we get very different types of eruptions. These are the ones that are the dangerous ones. These are the ones that will kill people if they're a sort of accident. And we get all sorts of different stuff coming. We get all these features, broken crystals and pumice and scoria, all this sort of geological terms you'll learn about as you go through that form as these rocks get torn apart in these really violent eruptions. This is an example of one of those. It's again in Italy. Um, this is Stromboli. It's a volcano that's been erupting more or less continuously for about 40 or 50 years. 
I had a chance to climb up it a few years ago, but when we arrived on the island on the boat, you can see that black smoke in the background, the, the volcano had just erupted. So again, some people would think this is scary as a geologist. I think this is really exciting. This is a chance to go and see these processes in action. Mount St. Helens, this was the last big eruption in North America. Um, this is what it used to look like before the eruption back in 1980. It's about a 3000 meter volcanic peak. And then after the eruption, it looks like this. It's dropped about 400, 500 meters off the top. You can see this massive crater in through here where the volcanoes erupted and all this material has come out and covered the hillsides. Geologically, this was a really, really small eruption, but by North American standards, it was a pretty big deal. And you can see the sort of the products of what was happening when Mount St. Helens was erupting. There was an ash column which went 25 kilometers up into the sky. Uh, it took 15 days. That ash could be found everywhere around the world and over a billion cubic meters of ash were erupted from that volcano. So it's a big eruption, but geologically, it's a very small one. Compared to some of the really big eruptions we've seen around the Earth, this is a really tiny one. They did all kinds of things around Mount St. Helens to try and understand how it works. They get to do really cool stuff where they drag that bucket you can see at the top from a helicopter, and they scoop up rock, and then they can cover it here. You can see the lady holding those samples is wearing sort of big fancy oven mitts and that's because that material is still hot. It's only just come out of the volcano and they're sampling it to try and understand the processes by which that volcano is erupted. These are other examples of uh, similar sort of eruptions. We're back in Italy now. This is Mount Etna. You can see on the left photo that chain of volcanic craters running down the hillside. You can see it here again, we're standing on this explosive debris, this sort of scoria material with a chain of volcanic craters. So as a geologist, as someone who studies these things, this is sort of heaven for me. I get to go and look at these rocks to try and understand those processes. Some of those things come out and you can see different types of eruptive products. These are examples from uh, Victoria in Australia, where you can see the type of eruption has changed over time. And we can use that to help us understand the processes that are going on in those volcanoes. Another example, this is Askia in Iceland erupted around the 1800s. And again, we can see different types of eruptive product. That fine pale gray material is, is sort of a dry eruption. And then as the eruption gets more water mixed in it from a glacier or something like that, we get these bigger, darker blocks. So we can see that transition and again, we can use it to try and piece these, these stories together. We get other sort of things coming out there. We get blocks of lava or what we call pyroclastic bombs coming out. And you can see these would have come out as hot, nearly still molten blocks of material. And they form these really cool shapes and drapes as they move through the earth and then hit the ground around the flanks of the volcano. You can see a couple of examples here of where those big blocks have come into those fine ashy layers. So you can see there's this really pale yellowy color ash material, and then these big blocks that you can sort of see around in the center of both of those photographs, they're those volcanic bombs which have come out of the volcano and impacted into those sediments. So these are really dynamic, energetic, vibrant environments, but very cool places to study. This is one of my, one of the sort of my favorite sets of photographs. So this is a place in, on Mount Etna, prior to one of their big eruptions. This is one of their alpine sort of bases where the guides would hang out. And you can sort of see here, it's, sort of, it's already a bit beaten up by the eruption, but this is all that's left of it now, after the eruption back in the 1980s. We're looking at the top corner of the building, which you can see inside that red circle on that photograph. That's all that's left. It's been buried by this sort of massive outpouring of lava or ash in this case. We get some good things associated with volcanoes. Uh, these are some of the geysers in Iceland and in uh, Yellowstone that sort of erupt where the water gets sucked down into the hot rocks and heats up and periodically shoots up. Old Faithful and Yellowstone's a really good example of those. And we also get hot springs. This is uh, the sort of the final photograph I'm gonna show you. This is a place called Grand Prismatic Springs in Yellowstone. And we're interested in this because it's telling us not only about the volcanic process, but it's telling us about how water is moving through the rocks and getting heated up. And the orange colors we see around here is because it's removing metals from those rocks and then dropping them out on the sides of the pool. 
And that's important because this is how we then link volcanoes to how we find some different types of mines and ore deposits and things like that. All right, so that's all I've got to say about volcanoes. Um, I'm happy to try and answer some of your questions. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now and we'll see what questions you have for me. Well, thank you, Dr. Hollings. So our first question today comes from Ms. White's class, grade fours, and they're wondering, do tectonic plates create volcanoes? Yeah, absolutely. So tectonic plates, or it's the movement of those tectonic plates that create volcanoes. So as the, as the plates of the oceanic crust move along and get pushed down underneath the earth, that's where they start to melt. And it's the melting of that material then comes back up and forms those volcanic arcs that we see in places like the Philippines or Indonesia or um, running down the coast of South America or in the Cascade Range in the US. That's because we're melting those tectonic plates to form the volcanoes. So our next question comes from Mr. Karan's classroom and they're wondering where does this lava come from? Different, it, the, the simple answer is it, it's coming from melting of material in the Earth's crust or in the Earth's interior. Different places it comes from different ways. So when we're talking about places like uh, the Philippines or the Cascade Range, it's because we're pushing down the crust you're heating it up as it's moving down into the hotter and hotter earth, and that causes it to melt. Places like Hawaii and Iceland, which are a little different because they're forming away from those edges of the plates where we're subducting them, they're forming because we have these hot columns of material that come up through the earth's interior and sort of pop up and burn their way through to form places like Hawaii. But ultimately, it's all coming from the earth's interior, the earth's mantle, where we're melting rock and then causing it to rise up. Miss Davies class is wondering, how is igneous rock formed? Okay, so most igneous rock is formed as, uh, from that melting process, from the melting in the Earth's interior. We can also do it if we push old crust down and melt it, but basically you have to take pre-existing material, heat it up a lot, either by adding, adding heat to it, or you can add water, which makes it melt, which seems a little different, but by some process changing the conditions so it goes from a solid to a melt, and that's how we form those igneous rocks. So you touched on this a little bit in that previous question, but the grade fours in Ottawa are wondering, what material composes lava? So lava is generally, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's what we call a mafic material because it, it has a low gas content, so it flows. So it has lots of elements in it like silica and magnesium and iron, um, it's formed by melting of pre-existing crustal material that comes up and it moves through the earth where different things happen to it and then it comes out of these lavas and as it crystallizes those elements form minerals. So in, in mafic lavas like Hawaii we get minerals like olivine and feldspar and pyroxene and those are the crystals that sort of make up the lava that we see today. So you brought up a slide earlier that had the ring of fire around it, um, and you mentioned that usually that's where we see a lot of our volcanoes. Um, why is it that we see them there? So the, the reason we're seeing them there is because that's where the Earth's plates are being subducted under the continent. So if you, if you look at the, the margins of the Earth's crust, then it's, it's those areas where those oceanic plates, so the Pacific generally, is being subducted under the continent. And it's, it's where we subduct that crust that we cause it to melt and that's where we get those volcanoes forming. You see it also in the Mediterranean where we've sort of pushed crust under Europe. Um, that's the same sort of process, but I think it's 80% of our volcanoes are in that ring of fire area because that's where most of those volcanoes, or that's where most of that subduction process, that crust is being pushed down into the earth. Is there a certain time of year where we see more eruptions than others? Not really. That Some people have tried to make those correlations. There's some research being done that suggests um, winter in the northern hemisphere might be more or less, but it's, it's really not robust. The volcanoes are really hard to predict. We're doing a lot of research trying to understand when volcanoes will erupt because of the risk associated with them, but we're not having very much luck and that they Pretty much a volcano will erupt whenever a volcano wants to erupt. They're very unpredictable. Um, there doesn't seem to be controls around time of year or, or anything like that that we've been able to recognize so far. 
So what happens if a volcano erupts underwater? Depends. Um, <laughs> if it's in relatively shallow water, then what can happen is you can actually form new land. So there's places in, in, the, in the Pacific where there are these islands which, when the volcano erupts, they sort of push above the surface a little bit, and then the volcano stops erupting and it gets eroded away and they drop back down and they grow again. And eventually, they might build up and grow enough to form somewhere like Hawaii. Um, if they're occurring at depth, really deep in the ocean floor, so along the Atlantic plate, along the Pacific plate, there are these features we call ridges where the crust is splitting apart. Those volcanoes are forming at depths of two to three to 4,000 meters of water pressure. And there we get very different styles of eruption because the weight of that water changes what happens. They tend to be less explosive. They tend to be um, less violent at depth. But if it happens at shallow levels, the mixture of water and hot rock can be really explosive and really violent. So those can be some of the really dangerous ones. Um, when we have one volcano erupt, can that affect the probability of having another one erupt? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, it depends how close they are, I think. So if you're on somewhere like Hawaii, where the big island on Hawaii is maybe four or five volcanoes, separate volcanoes that make up the island, maybe there's a chance there that the, an eruption in one will change the system and affect the other. But if you're talking somewhere like um, the Cascade Range in the US where Mount St. Helens is and Mount Rainier, all those volcanoes are far enough apart that probably they're independent systems of plumbing systems where the magma comes up. So eruption of one volcano won't affect what happens to the next one. Um, our next question today is about those rock bombs that you mentioned earlier. Yeah. Um, and they're wondering, are those, are those rare? Are those hard to find? They're pretty common. It dep if, if, you're, if you're in the right area, so if you were to go down to the southwest US and, and look at some of those relatively recent volcanoes and climb on those volcanoes, they're pretty easy to find. Um, it depends where you are. Um, they're a little harder to find in places like Hawaii because of the type of eruption. But if there's been these explosive eruptions, then yeah, in the right location around those volcanoes, they're pretty common. So our next question today is from Mr. Turner's grade four classroom, and they're wondering what is the biggest eruption that has ever occurred, or at least that you know of? Right, so the, the biggest explosive eruptions we know about are some in the Pacific. So the biggest one that's been around when we've had good records about it is a place called Krakatoa, uh, which is about in the 1800s. It was a very, very explosive eruption. It caused sort of what they call global winters because of the amount of ash that it pushed up into the atmosphere. Going back in the record, there's uh, one called Tambora, which we think was bigger than Krakatoa. And then going back in the geological record, we think there were some Yellowstone, for example, was probably a giant eruption about 100,000 years ago. The further back we go, the harder it is to be sure how big they are. Um, but yeah, and even where I stand now, where I live now in Thunder Bay, a billion years ago, this area was, North America was trying to rift apart and there were huge eruptions of lava at the bottom of Lake Superior. There's 30 kilometers of basalt built up because of eruptions. So it depends how you want to define eruptions, but certainly there have been some really big ones. Tambora was a really, really big one that we know about. Um, and then going back into the record, it gets a little harder to try and figure these things out. Our next question comes from Ms. Wright's classroom, and they're wondering how big were the boulders that came out of the Mount St. Helens eruption? Oh, wow. So there was, there was some really, there's, there's, there's two ways these things happen. Um, right at the time of the eruption, there was what we call the horizontal blast, where, where blocks that were maybe tens, 20 meters across would have come out. Most of the stuff that comes out of sort of the ash column would have maybe been up to a two or three, four meters across. It depends how violent the eruption is, how big it is. I've seen volcanic blocks maybe tens of meters across, but they're pretty unusual. A few meters across would be probably more typical. Our next question today comes from Ms. Rapparee's uh, grade four classroom in Maple, Ontario. And they're wondering which is the first volcano that, that erupted, or maybe that we have evidence for that erupted. Oh, wow. Um, that's a really interesting question. I don't know. So we can, we can look back in um, 
ice records in places like Antarctica and the North Pole. And we can see layers of ash in those ice layers, which are maybe 80, 90 to 100,000 years old. We can look back at geological records and we can date the rocks. And we think there are you know, eruptions that have erupted back. But the Earth would have originally have been a ball of molten material, so 4 billion years ago. And the rocks I study, which are two and a half to three billion years old here in Northern Ontario, there's evidence there that there were volcanoes erupting. So volcanoes have been around as long as the earth has been around. Um, so I, I, there's not really one I could name as the oldest, but they, they've been around as long as, as, long as, as long as there's been an earth, pretty much. So Brittany from Mr. Bradford's classroom is wondering, will we run out of magma? <laughs> uh, no. Not really. Um, the, the only way we will stop running out of magma is if the earth completely cools and we lose that molten interior that we have in the planet at the moment. And, you know, that may happen in 10, 20 billion years, but it's not something that's going to happen anytime soon. So we saw a picture in your presentation of a gentleman that was collecting a sample. Um, do we typically need to wear special suits to avoid either, either gases coming out or anything else that might be hazardous? Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's something that only, only professionals would do. Um, it depends a lot on the, the type of the eruption. You notice some of them had those big thermal gloves on, others, that was been a fairly slow moving basaltic flow so you can get close to it fairly predictably. But if you look at some of the videos that are available on YouTube and places like that, you'll see people wearing big shiny suits to keep them away from those heat. Those rocks, are, you know, that, that rock he was scooping with the hammer was probably a thousand degrees centigrade. So it's really, really hot. Um, I, that very first photograph I showed you of White Island, when we went there, we all had gas masks on because the fumes can be quite bad. It can be uh, quite a lot of sulfur in the air, smells like rotten eggs, um, but it can, it can be quite dangerous. And certainly you have to be very careful and, and very uh, well trained before you do the sort of stuff you saw in some of those photographs. Have we discovered any volcanoes on other planets? That's a really good question. So we think that some of the things on some of the shapes on Mars of some of the land masses on Mars look like volcanoes. Olympus Mons is one that springs to mind. We think those would have been ancient volcanoes. Um, some of the new work that's happening with the, the surveyors of places like Venus and stuff like that, it looks like there are volcanoes on there. The ones on Mars we think are probably quite similar to what would have been on Earth. The one on Venus are very different in terms of their composition. They look similar. They might sort of be gas volcanoes. We're still trying to understand that. But yeah, there certainly do seem to be volcanoes on other planets. So our next question today comes from uh, Ms. Wong's classroom and they're wondering where does the ash come from? So the ash comes from what happens is that when these really explosive eruptions occur, basically what you're doing is you're taking the rock and the magma and blasting it into very, very small pieces. And those, that ash is really fine grained pieces of rock that's been fragmented by those eruptions and then blasted up into this cloud. So it's not like wood ash, if you ever sort of have a fire and you get that sort of soft gray ash in there. Volcanic ash is really gritty, it's really abrasive. Um, it's, it makes it really hard on engines and motors around the time of Mount St. Helens. People are having all sorts of trouble with their cars because it was blocking the engines. Um, but that's what it is. It's basically fragmenting those rock fragments into really, really small pieces. So we've had tons of great questions today. Um, unfortunately, we're not gonna have time to get to all of them. Um, but just before we end, I was hoping to have you speak a little bit about um, your career path and how you ended up where you are today. <laughs> and maybe some advice uh, you have for students who are considering something similar for their future. So I, I, I started taking geology when I was at high school in the last two years. I, I grew up in England um, and I did what we called O and A levels in geology there. I found it just really interesting. I enjoyed being outdoors. I enjoyed looking at rocks. From there, I went on to university and did an undergraduate degree in, in geology. I did a PhD, um, became a doctor, which is in the, where I am now. Spent a few years in Australia and then moved to Thunder Bay where I'm now a professor at Lakehead. So it's, geology is a really exciting career path. If you like being outdoors, you like looking at rocks, you want to travel, see some of the world. There's all kinds of different career paths in academia, in industry, in government. There's a whole bunch of different things available to you. 
it's a great life if you, you know, for people say it's not work if you're doing something you love. And certainly for me, geology is something I love. The chance to go out and see these amazing places and study these really cool rocks is, is really fun. Well, that's all the time we have for today, but thank you, Dr. Hollings, for taking the time um, to talk to us a little bit today about your experiences and for answering all of our questions. My pleasure. It's been great to talk to everyone. Next time on PIR Live Event, we'll be going behind the scenes at the Canadian Light Source for a virtual tour of their synchrotron. More information about these webinars and other PIR educational programs are available at PIRweb.org. Thanks for tuning in. Have a wonderful day.